Now from the far western provinces of Xinjiang and Tibet to the northern province of Inner Mongolia, even down to the special administrative region of Hong Kong, China's government is being accused of eradicating local languages by forcing citizens around the country to learn Mandarin Chinese. Take a look at these recent headlines. Language rules for Inner Mongolia, another step to erode ethnic groups in China. China's push for Mandarin education in Inner Mongolia is a tool for political repression. Now, what is the truth behind these allegations and what is China's government's main objective by allowing its citizens around the country to learn Mandarin Chinese? This is going to be a great topic. Let's jump into it. Hi everybody, my name is Cyrus Jansen. I'm an American expat and someone that has lived in China for over 10 years. And as a student of the Mandarin language for well over a decade, this is a topic that is extremely important to me. Now, if you are new to this channel, I wanna welcome you and I invite you to hit that subscribe button. What we do is we make weekly vlogs about China and its role in society today because it is my vision and my goal to help more people around the world truly understand China. Now to start today's video, I'm gonna bring you back to my home country of America and give you an important perspective. Now I am from the Sunshine State, beautiful Florida, and it doesn't matter where you travel in America. You can be in Florida or you can go up north to Minnesota. You can go out west to Utah, even to the great Pacific Northwest state of Alaska. Now you can travel amongst any of the 50 states and what you will notice is that everywhere in America, people speak one language, that is American English. Now, of course, there are going to be different accents. An American from New York is going to speak a little bit differently than an American from Texas. However, in America, 99.9% .9 of the words are the same, and if you speak American English, you will have no problem traveling throughout America. However, this is unfortunately how many people look at China. Many people just say, wow, China is a big country, and in China, the Chinese people speak Chinese. But it's not actually that simple, because today, in China right now, there are over 300 different dialects and variations of the Chinese language that are alive and thriving within China today. Now, to give you a better perspective of this, let's take a look at this map. Now, this is a map detailing the 56 different ethnicities amongst the Chinese people in China. And you can really see on all corners of China, there is a tremendous amount of different ethnicities at play here. Now, what's important to note is that it's not just these different ethnicities that have different languages. Languages vary based on province, region, ethnicities, even by the cities themselves. So again, this is how China has well over 300 different dialects. Now, some people have asked me, Cyrus, what is the difference between these dialects? Are they really just different accents or are they completely different languages altogether? Well, let's give everybody some perspective. For example, let's imagine that you wanted to say that something is not possible or you are not able to do it in Mandarin Chinese. You would use these two characters and this is pronounced 不行, 不行. Again, this is Mandarin Chinese, the national language. However, if you go down to southern China, where Cantonese is predominantly spoken, you're going to notice that they're going to say this phrase a different way. Notice how the characters change here, and the way that you pronounce this in Cantonese is mm da, mm da. But again, if you go to the metropolis of Shanghai, where they speak Shanghainese, you're going to notice a very different way. Listen to this, valese, valese. So there you have it, three very different ways to pronounce this phrase. Bu xing, mm da. Valese. And again, this is just three of literally hundreds of different languages at play here. Now, if you're interested to learn more about China's regional languages, one of the best places to start is examining the local currency. Now, this is the back of a hundred renminbi note in China, and you can notice on the upper right portion, there are no less than five different languages printed on the back. Let's break them down for you. The first language that we see is Mandarin Pinyin. Now Mandarin, of course, is Chinese characters, but this is in the Pinyin form, which means that it is written in the English alphabet. This says Zhongguo Renmin Inhang, which means China People's Bank. Now the language directly underneath that is the Mongolian language. Underneath that is the Uyghur language, which is spoken in the Xinjiang province. The fourth language is Tibetan, which of course is spoken in the Tibetan region. And the fifth and final language is the Zhuang language. Now what you'll notice for that fifth language, the Zhuang language, is that it also uses the English alphabet. 
let's take a look at this sign from the Guangxi Autonomous Region. Now, Guangxi is the province that the Zhuang language is spoken. This is a local sign and that is written in both languages. You have the Zhuang language on top. Again, that is the regional language and it is followed by the Mandarin Chinese equivalent underneath. And this is something that many people don't understand is that when you're traveling around China, it's very common to see many different languages, you know, being printed on national adverts or, you know, tourist attractions, things like that. Usually they will have the local language printed there, but they will also have, of course, Mandarin, which is the official language and the national language of China. Now, if you're interested to learn more about the ethnic minorities and their languages, one of the best resources is the Chinese constitution. Fun fact, anybody is able to find this information. The Chinese constitution is actually available online in both English and Chinese. And I'm gonna take you to article four, where it specifically states that all nationalities in the People's Republic of China are equal. The state protects the lawful rights and interests of the minority nationalities and upholds and develops a relationship of equality, unity, and mutual assistance among all of China's nationalities. Notice this last sentence, all nationalities have the freedom to use and develop their own spoken language and written languages and to preserve or reform their own folkways and customs. Now, earlier this summer, two of my favorite content creators in China, Daniel Dumril, a Canadian entrepreneur in Shenzhen, and Li Jingjing, a fantastic reporter from Beijing, both had the opportunity to travel to Tibet and they documented their adventure there. Let's take a look. This is a tweet from Jingjing and she shares, I walked into a Tibetan class at the Sanka Middle School at Sanka County. Students are learning how to write poems in the Tibetan language. It's a mandatory class for all students at this school. Now the Tibetan language is certainly being preserved in Tibet, but if you go on to watch that video, you're gonna notice that students in Tibet are also learning two other languages. Now notice the blue textbook to the left here. It clearly states that is English textbook. And then the third textbook that they have is a textbook that is written again in the local language Tibetan with Mandarin Chinese. So if you are a student in Tibet right now, you are actually learning to become trilingual. You're learning your local language Tibetan. You're also learning the national language Mandarin. But of course, you're also learning English because this is an incredibly important language for really everybody in the world to learn. Now Jingjing goes on to share, here are some clips of their music class. They were singing Tibetan folk songs in the Tibetan language, learning both traditional Chinese instruments and traditional Western equivalents. Now, the reason that I give these illustrations is I want everybody to understand that regional languages will always play a significant role in the lives of many Chinese people. Again, if you are from Tibet, this is a very important part of your culture and the Tibetan school system, the Chinese government is doing an excellent job in preserving this part of the language. However, it's very important to note that for the future prospects and for the future development of Tibet, it's really important that they are connected with the rest of China and everybody is unified by this common language, and that is Mandarin. Now in 2012, I had an amazing experience that really taught me the importance of people learning Mandarin in China. I was asked by my Chinese colleague to be the best man at his wedding. And at that wedding, I had a chance to meet his parents. Now he is originally from a very small village in the center of China, and this was his parents' first time in their entire life that they actually left their village. They left the village, took the long train ride, and came to the big city of Shanghai. Now I did what any best man would do. I walked over to his parents, introduced myself, and said, welcome to Shanghai. There was only one problem. Neither of them spoke Mandarin. But this was really an amazing perspective for me to learn. Here we have two Chinese nationals, a husband and wife that are unable to travel around China. They're unable to travel around China because they simply do not know how to speak the national language. Now for my colleagues' parents, this is probably not a big deal for them. You know, they were in their late 60s, maybe early 70s. No doubt they will spend the remaining years of their life living in that local village. But if you are a young person coming from that village, what is your future if you can only speak that local dialect? 
Now, over the last 30 years, one of the greatest accomplishments from the Chinese government is the ability to lift over 800 million people out of poverty. You've heard me say this many times on previous videos, but 80% of the world's poverty alleviation over the last three decades has come directly from China. And one of the main tools that the Chinese government uses to eradicate poverty is education. And again, this initiative to really help more people in China speak the national language is something that should be encouraged because what they are doing is they are equipping more people to have a better future, have more opportunity. Again, China is not going out and saying, let's eliminate Tibetan, Mongolian, Uyghur, let's eliminate all these local dialects. No. China's government, as outlined in that constitution, make it very clear that local languages are alive and they are thriving and everybody can have access to these languages. However, it is very, very important for the country moving forward and certainly for the individual job perspectives and for the future of individuals in China, especially the youth in China today, that all of them must be able to speak Mandarin Chinese. However, I think the real problem here is that we have a double standard when we look at China. For example, if we had a Western country that was doing the same thing, I think we would look at it in a very different light. To give you some perspective on this, let's travel to the UK and look at the country of Wales. Now, one of the things that really separates Wales from other countries in the UK is the fact that Wales has its own language, the Welsh language. And to give you some perspective of this language, let's take a look at this map. Now, this is a map of the country of Wales broken down by the percentage of people that speak the Welsh language in each perspective region. Notice how the majority of Welsh speakers are concentrated to the northwest area of the country. The Welsh language is definitely very important for the country of Wales. It is what makes them very unique. And I'm sure that you will find many people and many families that are very passionate about speaking the Welsh language. And I'm sure that many parents will want to teach their children the Welsh language. However, I do think you would be very hard pressed to find somebody in Wales that, said, that would say, I only want my children to speak the Welsh language. I don't want them to learn English. Because if you did this, this would severely limit this children's future because they would really be only able to live in their local village. Now, in conclusion, I want everybody to realize that it is very important for every Chinese national within China today to speak the national language. This is why countries institute national languages. Again, if you are a young person in China right now and you can only speak your regional language, what future do you have? You're not going to be able to attend university in China. You're not going to be able to go to a big city to seek a better job, to seek a better life you are going to be limited to only living in your region. And this is what China's government is trying to accomplish this. Let's make no mistake, China's regional languages are alive and thriving and they are being preserved. But again, no regional language is more important than learning Mandarin. And again, this is why Mandarin has become one of the most important languages in the world. Take a look at this headline from a decade ago. This is Barack Obama's daughter, Sasha, who made international headlines when she was able to practice Chinese with China's president, Hu Jintao. And take a look at this video. Now, the little girl in this video is none other than Donald Trump's granddaughter. And you can see these examples, the two most recent United States presidents are having their children and grandchildren, respectively, learn Mandarin Chinese. Mandarin Chinese is exploding around the world. It has become one of the most popular foreign languages in the world. And to give you guys a final perspective, you know that I'm coming live at you from Vancouver, Canada, and I want to bring you to West Vancouver to this private academy. Now, this is the Mulgrave School, which is one of the most expensive and one of the best private academies in the entire Vancouver region. And one of the things that makes the Mulgrave School stand out amongst other private academies is that it is the only private school in the Vancouver area that allows its students to study Mandarin Chinese from pre-kindergarten all the way through the 12th grade. This is why so many affluent families here in Vancouver are choosing to send their kids to the school so they can get exposure to this language. 
Now everyone, my final thought is this, Mandarin Chinese is the most spoken language in the world. Families around the world are encouraging their children to learn Mandarin because it is a tremendous asset for them moving forward, and I believe it's the same for the people within China. Learning Mandarin is going to be an amazing asset for all of China because it will unite the entire country in one common language. Keep your regional language, learn the common language, and thrive together as one community. Thank you. Everybody, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to spend it with me here on YouTube, and I want to give a special thanks to those members of our Patreon community. If you're interested in helping this channel grow and being part of an exclusive club, I invite you to click down in the link below. Come join us on Patreon. We have an amazing community there. Again, my name is Cyrus. I can't wait to see you guys in next week's video. Thank you, and we'll see you then.